Okay, so the first one here, we are looking for the equation of a line perpendicular to y equals two thirds x plus seven. All we care about there is that slope from that line, the two thirds. Perpendicular means our slope is going to be the opposite, so that's positive. Our slope with the perpendicular is negative. Reciprocal, 3 over 2. And we can either use, well, we have three forms. We can use standard form. Remember, that's ax plus by plus c equals 0. We have our slope-intercept form, which is our graphing form, which is y equals mx plus b, so we do y equals negative. 3 over 2x plus b, and then we'd solve, using that 0.65, we'd solve for b. Or we can use point slope form, which we looked at last week, where it's y minus the y point of 5 equals our slope of negative 3 over 2 times x minus the x-coordinate of 6. So that is our point slope form. If we put it in over here, of course, remember you'd put in five for y, six for x, and you would solve for b, which ends up being, I think 13 or something like that. Any questions on that one? Okay, number two, find the equation of the line parallel to y equals negative one-fourth x minus three. So again, all we care about for that equation is slope, negative one-fourth. Parallel means it has the same slope. Is that better? Okay, so parallel means it has the same slope. So that's going to be negative one-fourth x plus b if we're looking at that y-intercept form. Otherwise, point slope form, it's y minus the y coordinate there is 7 equals the slope negative 1 fourth times x minus a negative 8 becomes x plus 8. So that's our point slope form. Otherwise, again, if we wanted to, we could plug that form into the slope, that point into the slope intercept equation. 7 equals negative 1 fourth times 8 plus b. And we could solve that, we would end up getting, I believe that is 9, would be b. So it would be y equals negative 1 fourth x plus 9. On a test, either one of those would be acceptable. When I ask you to find the equation of a line, I don't specify what form on the unit test. In my math lab, of course, for the homework and quizzes, it will tell you what form it wants the equation in. Just a reminder, by the way, the, the unit one test is coming up two weeks from today. Number three, then, is just kind of a review of the transformations or translations of functions, how they move about the graph as we do things either to the domain or the range. So we have this zigging line here, zigging line that we have for f of x. I ask you to find then what's the graph of f of x minus 3. When we've subtracted 3 from x here, we are subtracting 3 from the domain, which means we shift it along the x-axis. And that means 3 behaves as though it's 0. It shifts the whole thing to the right three units. So this point now would be here. This point would be here. This point would be there. And so on. So it's going to look like that. That is f of x minus 3. The second one here, we have the function and then we subtracted 2 after the function. That means we're subtracting to from the range after we have the result of f of x. So that means we shift in the direction of the sign. So it's in minus 2, we go down 2 on the y-axis, in the y direction. So this point shifts down 2, this point shifts down 2, 
this point shifts down to, and so on. Any questions on that? Any questions on the other homework from last Wednesday? Okay. So today we are continuing to talk about functions. We focused on linear functions and properties of linear functions mostly last Wednesday. I want to talk about general functions today. So we had functions like f of x equals 2x squared minus 5. That is a function. Um, from the equation, it's more difficult to tell. Once we graph it, remember, we can have that vertical line test. If on the graph there's no point where a vertical line crosses it more than once, then it's a function. Or from ordered pairs or mappings, we could tell if they're functions. As long as no value of the domain ever goes to more than one value of the range. F of x squared minus 5, or sorry, 2x squared minus 5, looks something like this. It's a parabola. So when I go to find define the domain of that, as it almost always is true, it goes from negative infinity to positive infinity. The range is a little bit trickier. The range here, you can see, never gets less than negative 5. It does equal negative 5, so we include that in the range. It goes from negative 5 to positive infinity. Of course, we had the square bracket, so to know that we include the negative 5. So the big question is, when is the domain not all real numbers? When does it not go from negative infinity to positive infinity? We mentioned this last week. The biggest thing is we cannot divide by 0. That's a big no-no. So if we have a function, f of x equals... 7 over 3x, oh, let's just do minus 2. The domain of this function to find that domain, we have to figure out what is excluded. And what is excluded is any values that would, that would be forcing us to divide by zero. In other words, any values that make the denominator of that fraction zero. So we write out 3x minus 2 cannot equal zero. Well, to find out what x cannot be, we're going to solve the equation 3x minus 2 equals zero and see what values make that happen, and then we're going to exclude those values. So we'll add 2, 3x equals 2, and we'll divide by 3. x equals 2 thirds. So what that means is, in our domain here, x cannot equal 2 thirds. Because if x equals 2 thirds, then that we're dividing by 0. So the domain here... We go from negative infinity to two-thirds open bracket, showing that we exclude the two-thirds, united with or unioned with two-thirds again, the open bracket, to positive infinity. So that's showing that the only gap in that domain is two-thirds. We might have f of x equals oops, my pen to work here, sorry. 
four X over five X plus 20. So now here, even though there's an X in the numerator that does not affect our domain at all, our domain is only affected by that denominator. We cannot divide by zero. So again, we're gonna solve five X plus 20 equals zero to find the values that are excluded in our domain. So we subtract 20. Get 5x equals negative 20. Then we divide by the 5. x equals 4. So what that means is for our domain, x cannot equal... Oops, that should be a negative 20. That should be a negative 4, sorry. So x cannot equal negative 4 in our domain. So when we write our domain, once again, we go from negative infinity, that excluded value, in this case negative 4, with an open bracket, united with from the negative four with the open bracket to positive infinity, and that's our domain. And as we saw a little bit last week, it's possible to have more than one value excluded. We might have f of x equals seven x minus three over x squared minus three x Minus 10. So when we look at this again, it still comes down to that denominator cannot equal zero. So we're going to solve to see what makes that denominator equal zero and then exclude those values. This is not a linear equation anymore. It's quadratic. So it's already equal to zero. We're going to factor. If I factor x squared minus 3x minus 10, what do I get? X and X, what values do I get? X minus five and X plus two, good. So then we have to solve those two linear equations, X minus five equals zero or X plus two equals zero. So we add the five to both sides to get X equals five or over here, subtracting two, x equals negative two. So those are the two values that are excluded from our domain. So to write that using our interval notation, we go from negative infinity to negative two with the round bracket, united with negative two up to five with the round bracket, united with five to positive infinity. Any questions there? I'm going to have you guys try one in your notes. F of X equals 5X over X squared minus 25. I'll give you a couple minutes to solve that. Find out what is the domain of that function. So what we're looking at here is the denominator cannot equal zero. So X squared minus 25 here cannot equal zero. So we're solving to see where X squared minus 25 does equal zero so we can exclude those values x squared minus 25 is a difference of perfect squares. So you can factor that to be x plus 5 and x minus 5. And that's a perfectly fine way to do it. Factor it and then solve both of those equations. But did anybody notice that you could actually solve this with the square root method? x squared minus 25 equals 0. If you wanted to, you could have just added 25 
You get x squared equals 25, and then square root both sides. The square root of x squared is x. The square root of 25 is positive or negative 5. Same results you'll get if you solve those two equations. So here, x cannot be negative 5, and x cannot be positive 5. So our domain... We go from negative infinity to negative 5, and excluding it, united with, <coughs> from negative 5, positive 5, again excluding the positive 5, united with, positive 5 to positive infinity. There's our domain. Any questions there? Now, the other restriction we had on our domain was we cannot take the root, the even root, of a negative. So if I have f of x equals the fourth root, of 3x plus 12. First of all, it's an even root, so that means that this applies. That cannot be negative. 3x plus 12 cannot be less than 0. It can equal 0. It can't be less than 0. So we're going to solve to see where it would be. In fact, let's do this. Rather than solving to see what's excluded, let's solve to see what's allowed. It's allowed to be greater than or equal to zero. Then we'll solve for the domain rather than solving for what's excluded from the domain. So I'm going to subtract 12. 3x is greater than negative 12. Now even though that's a negative, we didn't flip the symbol there because we didn't multiply or divide by a negative. We'll divide by 3 to get that x has to be greater than or equal to negative 4. So our domain, if we're sticking to interval notation, is negative 4. Now it's greater than or equal to, so I should have used a square bracket there instead of a round one, to infinity. Greater than is from that number to infinity. Now, there is another notation we sometimes use. This was, of course, interval notation here. But there's also that set builder or solution set notation. And for using that, remember, it's those squiggly brackets. The domain is all values of x such that x is greater than or equal to negative 4. I'm going to have you try one. Find the domain for f of x equals the fifth root of 2x minus 10. This one wasn't very nice of me. If you're calculating a number right now or solving an equation, you've missed it. This is an odd root, which means there's no limits on the values it can take on. You can take an odd root of a negative number. There's only limits, the, the, only the, the positive requirement is only for even roots. So this domain is from negative infinity to positive infinity. I realize that wasn't very nice. So what our main goal for today is to and our Algebra with our functions is actually consistent. 
I'm going to do, I'm going to define two functions here. f of x equals 2x squared minus 5x. Actually, I'm going to get 2x squared minus 6x. And g of x equals 2x. And I want to find f plus g of 3. Doesn't really matter what value I put in there. I can approach this in one of two ways. I can do f of 3 plus g of 3 and get an answer, add them together. Or I can just add the functions themselves. Let's do it as f of 3 plus g of 3 and see what happens. So f of 3 is 2 times 3 squared minus 6 times 3. 3 squared is 9 times 2 is 18. 6 times 3 is 18 equals 0. g of 3 is 2 times 3 equals 6. So f of 3 is 0 plus g of 3 is 6. f of 3 plus g of 3 is 6. Well, what if I did f plus g? That'd be 2x squared minus 6x plus 2x. I'm adding the functions themselves before I put the value in. So f plus g of x is 2x squared, negative 6x plus 2x is negative 4x. So f plus g of 3 requires us to put 3 into that fun into that equation. So 2 times 3 squared minus 4 times 3. 3 squared is 9 times 2 is 18 again. Minus 4 times 3 is 12. 18 minus 12 is 6. You notice I get the same value. I can add the functions algebraically, then put the value in, or I can put the value into each function and add the two results. In your notes, I want you to find for me quick f minus g of 7. So you could have done this one of two ways. You could have found f of 7 first, which would be 2 times 7 squared minus 4 times 7. 7 squared is 49 times 2 is 98. 4 times 7 is 28. 98 minus 28 is 70. That's f of 7. G of 7 is just 2 times 7, otherwise known as 14. Subtracting those gives us F of 7 minus G of 7 equals 56. If I wanted to do F minus G of 7, I've got the 2X squared minus 4X minus 2x, that gives us 2x squared minus 6x. 
Oops, I did that wrong. It's 2x squared minus 6x. 2x, sorry. Else if I can copy my f of x right. So f of x is 2x squared minus 6x. G of x is 2x, so subtracting 2x from it. Gives us 2x squared minus 8x. So then we evaluate that at 7. 2 times 7 squared minus 8 times 7. That means I evaluated this one wrong over here too, didn't I? This should have been 6 instead of 4. That'd be 6 times 7, making that 98 minus 42. So that would have been 56. 56 minus 14 would have given us 42 there for f of 7 minus g of 7. Sorry about that. So over here, I'll try not to screw this one up. 7 squared is 49 times 2 is 98. 8 times 7 is 56. 98 minus 56 is 42. So we get 42 there as well. So if I calculate them right, we get the same answer either way. Well, what about f times g? Let's put in 2, f times g of 2. I'm going to have you guys do f of 2 times g of 2. I will find f times g of x and substitute into that. So I'm going to give you a couple minutes, and then we'll come see if we get the same. So if I do f times g of x, f of x is the 2x squared minus 6. g of x is the 2x. When I multiply those together, I distribute the 2x. I get 4x to the third minus 12x squared. So that is my f times g of x. So I do f times g of 2. I substitute 2 into that for x. 2 to the third is 8, 2 squared is 4. So 4 times 8 is 32, 12 times 4 is 48. I subtract to get negative 16. When you guys did f of 2, what did you guys get for f of 2? Anybody? Negative 4? Sounds right to me because you got 2 squared is 4 times 2 is 8 minus 2 times 2 is 12. I get negative 4. Good. How about for g of 2? Let's take a look. g of 2 is 2 times 2, which is a positive 4. So f of 2 times g of 2 
is negative 4 times positive 4, which is negative 16. We get the same result. <clears throat> Any questions there so far? Okay, what about f divided by g of x? This one's going to work exactly the same way, except we have one limitation. And that is, G, um, not g, x cannot equal zero. Why would x not be able to equal zero? Perfect. Yes. If x is zero, g of x is two times zero, which is zero. And since we are dividing by g of x here, we would be dividing by zero. So we cannot divide by zero. So the only value that cannot be used in f divided by g of x is zero. Any other value would work. Now I've kind of beat it to death here showing you all the examples. So all I'm going to do is we're going to calculate f divided by g of x by dividing the functions. f of x is the 2x squared minus 6x. And g of x is just 2x. So when we divide those out, 2x squared divided by 2x is just x. Negative 6x divided by 2x, the x's divide out. Negative 6 divided by 2 is just negative 3. So f divided by g of x is just x minus 3. But again, that only can only be used for x not equal to zero. Any questions there? So those operations, the standard arithmetic operations hold for the algebra of our functions. But we can introduce a new function, which is or a new operation, which is more powerful in our algebraic function. Up above, two of our operations are what we refer to as commutative. Addition and multiplication are commutative. So if we took f plus g of x, that's going to be the same as g plus f of x. You get the same result. Also, multiplication is commutative, so f times g of x would be equivalent to g times f of x. Well, we mentioned that subtraction and division are not the main operations. They are not commutative. They are simply the, the inverses for addition and multiplication. That commutative property doesn't hold for them. The composite function or the composite operation on functions is a way of combining functions consecutively. The symbol is a circle like that. F composite G of X is actually telling us to calculate g of x and put the value of that result into f of x. So let's take a look at what f composite g of x would be. Remember, f of x. We've defined as 2x squared minus 6x. G of x is simply 2x. 
So we're going to take g of x, which is 2x, and plug it into f, wherever the x is. So f of g of x is equal to 2 times the 2x squared minus 6 times the 2x. Two x squared, well two squared is four, x squared is x squared. I should finish that piece then. Two times four x squared is eight x squared. And then minus six times two x is gonna be minus 12 x. That's F composite G of X. If I wanted to find F composite G of three, well, I could just use this function I found here, eight times 3 squared minus 12 times 3. And see what value I get. 3 squared is 9. Eight times nine is 72. Minus 12 times 3 is 36. I get 36 for F composite G of X. But I could have just done f of g of 3, where I just take 3 and I put it into g first. So I find g of 3, which in this case is just 2 times 3, which is 6. And then I can plug that 6 into f. So g of 3 is 6. So f of g of 3 is f of 6. So notice the result of G at that value is what goes into F. So that's going to be two times six squared minus six times six six squared is thirty six. Two times 36 is 72. Six times six is 36, and that subtracts. 72 minus 36 is 36. We get the same value. So the big question is, is F composite G of X commutative? So what I'm asking really is, does F composite G of X equal, I'll put a big question mark over the equal sign, G composite F of X? Well, we can do this by either taking a value and putting it into each. We use three up above, we could put three in for G composite F of X, if we wanted to put three in for F and to put that result into G. So F of three is two X squared, so two times three squared minus six times three. Three squared is nine. Two times nine is 18, six times three is 18, that's zero. F of three is zero. We plug that into G. The result of F of three was zero, so we put zero into G. Well, that's gonna be two times zero, which is zero. That is not the same result we got for 
F composite G of three. F composite G of three was 36. This is G composite F of three equals zero. They're not commutative. In fact, we can see it if we can combine, if we combine the functions like we did before. G composite F of X is saying, take F of X and plug it into G of X. Well, G of X is two times X. So in place of the X there, we're going to put two X squared minus six X. Two times two X squared is four X squared. 2 times negative 6x is negative 12x. That is very different than what we had up above. So this is f, so this is g composite f of x. If you recall, when we found f composite g, What was it? 8x to the third minus 12x squared. Very different functions. Well, this discussion of composites brings us up to our next relationship, which is inverse. We've seen inverses in our operations. We saw if I take a number x and I add another number to it, if I add y to it, I'm going to get a result. If I want to undo that, if I want to reverse it, I use subtraction. I subtract y, that gets me right back to x. If I multiply, if I had x and I multiply by y, I'm going to get a value. I want to get back to just x, I divide by the y and it cancels that out. I'm left with just x. Addition and subtraction are inverses of each other. Multiplication and division are inverses of each other. They undo the effects of the other. So we want to look at inverses of functions. A function takes one set and maps it into another set. So what we're looking at is going to take one number and turns it into another number. So what we want to come up with is a function that reverses that, takes that final number and converts it back into the number we started with. Okay, it is time for a break. It's 1021. Um, let's come back at 1030 and we'll continue from there. So inverses of functions, how does it work? Well, an inverse of a function, again, if you do something, it gets you right back to what you started with. Um, the easiest way to define inverses of functions is f of x and g of x are inverses. If f composite g of x equals the identity, just x, equals the value. Or the other way around should be true as well. g composite f of x should also be an identity. This is the only time, by the way, that the two composites are commutative, that they'll give you the same result as when the two functions are inverses. Now there are some simple inverses out there. If I define f of x to be x plus two, well, it's pretty obvious that g of x, the inverse of x, and actually I'm gonna use this notation. The inverse of x, f with that little negative one means the inverse of x is just x minus two. If you add two to the value, you subtract two to the value. So we're gonna ignore those types of inverses. Those are kind of boring. They don't really tell us much. We wanna look at 
a little bit more complex inverse. So let's take a look at something like f of x equals 3x minus 2. And how would we find the inverse of that? So to find the inverse of f of x equals 3x minus 2, there are steps we're going to take. Step 1, we're going to put y back in for f of x. So we're going to write this as y equals 3x minus 2. Step 2, we're going to exchange the domain and range. In other words, we're going to exchange x and y in that equation. So instead of y equals 3x minus 2, it's going to be x equals 3y minus 2. And then our final step, step 3, is to solve this for y again. So I'm going to solve this for y, which means I have to add 2 to both sides. So I have x plus 2 equals 3y. That minus 2 is gone. And then I have to divide by 3. Now remember, when we divide an equation, we have to divide every piece on each side by that number. We divide by 3. Everything on the left side gets divided by 3. So the 3 gets canceled out, x plus 2 all over 3 equals y. Now we would typically switch that order around and write it as y equals x plus 2 over 3. And we could, if we wanted to, add a fourth step, which is to, again, replace y, go back to f of x only now it's f inverse of x. So f inverse of x here equals x plus 2 over 3. Let's test it. Let's make sure this is true. So f composite, f inverse of x. But remember, f was 3x minus 2, correct? 3x minus 2. I'm going to replace the x in there with f of x. So where the x was, I'm going to put in f inverse of x, which is x plus 2 over 3. So now when I go to combine here, I do the algebra 3 times the x plus 2 over 3. I make that 3 over 1, so it's a fraction. And now the 3s cross cancel. That's x plus 2 in the parentheses and then minus 2. The plus 2 and the minus 2 cancel out. That gives me x. So f composite f inverse of x does equal x, which is what we're hoping for. So what that is saying is for f of x equals 3x minus 2, the inverse is... x plus 2 over 3. So now we said these are commutative. The only time that our composite is commutative. So if g of x is x plus 2 over 3, what's the inverse of g? Well, x plus 2 over 3 is the inverse of 3x minus 2, it's commutative, so the opposite, the reverse must be true. 
3x minus 2 has to be the inverse of x plus 2 over 3. And we can check that. g composite g inverse of x. Where the x is here, we're going to replace that with 3x minus 2. Now there's nothing we can do in the parentheses there. Nothing that needs to be done to the parentheses are not being multiplied by anything. So we just take them out. 3x minus 2 plus 2 over 3. And now the minus 2 and the plus 2 combine to make 0. So that's just 3x over 3. 3x divided by 3, the 3s cancel out, we just have x. So it proves that 1 is the inverse of the first, and the first is the inverse of the other as well. So if I ask you, is h of x equals the square root of x minus 2, the inverse of p of x equals x squared plus 2. If I ask you if those are inverses, we can go a couple of routes. I could actually try to find the inverse of one of them and see if it gives us that other function, or I can do the composite and see if it gives us x. If I try to do the composite here, though, h composite p of x, that's saying I'm going to put p of x, the x squared minus 2, into h of x. So the square root of x becomes the square root of x squared plus 2 minus 2. Well, that doesn't work out real neatly. The square root of x squared plus 2 is not easy to, to simplify. If I tried it the other way, p composite h of x. So I'm taking h of x and putting it into p. So x squared becomes the square root of x minus 2 squared. Then the minus, oops, the plus 2 there. The square root of x minus 2 squared isn't terrible to do. The square root of x squared is just x. Square root of x times negative 2 is negative 2. Square root of x times 2 is negative 4. Square root of x. This is just our properties of a perfect square trinomial. Negative 2 squared. Oops, there should be an x in here. Negative 2 squared is a positive 4. So plus 4. So that is the square root of x minus 2 squared. And I still have the plus 2 on the end here. Well, I can combine the 4 and the negative 2 make 2. Oops, that should be plus 2. So the 4 and the plus 2 should make 6. Oops. So h composite p of x was tough to simplify. I just had to leave it at that. p composite h of x... We could simplify some to get it to here. That's still not equal to x. These are not inverses. Let's do the inverse of p of x. So p inverse of x. And see what we get there. So I'm going to write that as y equals x squared plus 2. I'm going to exchange x and y. So x equals y squared plus 2. And now I'm going to solve for y. What do I have to do to get y by itself? What's my first step? Subtract 2. Good. So I have x minus 2 equals y squared. And what's my final thing I have to do? y is currently squared. I have to square root it to get rid of the squared. But notice I have to square root the whole side. So it's the square root of x minus 2 equals y. 
as I switch that order around, that was P of X, right? Yep. So that's the P inverse of X is equal to the square root of X minus two. Note the difference was up here, it was the square root of X minus two is outside of the radicals. So that's why it was not a successful inverse. I'm going to have you guys in your notes find the inverse of a couple of functions for me. So the first one is going to be g of x equals 5x plus 3. And the second one is going to be h of x equals the square root of x plus 5. I'll give you a minute to find each of those. I mean, you may not be done yet, but let's see how you're doing here. So for the first one, we're going to replace the g of x, the f of x notation with y. So y equals 5x plus 3. I will exchange the x and y. x equals 5y plus 3. And I'm going to solve for y. What's my first step? Subtract 3, good. So x minus 3 equals 5y. And then divide by 5. Perfect. So x minus 3 over 5 equals y. Or in function notation, that was g. This would be g inverse of x equals x minus 3 over 5. For h of x, once again, I'll put y in there for h of x. So y equals the square root of x plus 5. And I'll exchange the x and y. So x equals the square root of y plus 5. And we will solve for y. First thing we have to do is... Subtract the 5, good. So x minus 5 equals the square root of y. Last step. Square it, very good. Now we could leave this as y plus 5 squared. But let's go ahead and do that perfect square trinomial. So x squared is x squared x times negative 5 is negative 5x times 2 is negative 10x. Negative 5 squared is positive 25 equals, of course, the square root of y squared is y. So putting that in function notation, this is h inverse of x equals x squared minus 10x plus 25. Any questions there? Now, by the way, if you wanted to test these to see if they truly are inverses of each other, you could do what we did up above and try to substitute one into the other, but that algebra does get a little bit tricky. You can always just pick a couple of points and see, you know, does... G composite, G inverse of, let's just pick a number, like five. Does that give us back five? Remember, whatever number we put into that, we should get back out. So if I put five into the inverse, the inverse is x minus three. That's gonna be five minus three divided by five. So that's two fifths is what we get for G inverse. 
I put that then into G. G of two fifths. Well, that's going to be five times two fifths plus three. Five times two fifths is two plus three is five. So yes, if I pick a number and put it into that composite, I do end up getting back the same number I started with. You can try it with different values if you wanted to be sure. You could switch the order and do G inverse composite with G for numbers if you want to, to make sure you get whatever you put in here, you get back that same value. How do you know if it's possible to find the inverse of a function? Well, when we tested the graph of a function, so if we tested the graph to see if it could be a function, we took a curve and we did the vertical line test. And that vertical line test, if we move that line across the graph, it could never cross the graph more than once at any one point at any one time. This is a function. That line never crosses it more than once. The question is, is it invertible? Oops. Is this an invertible function? Well, when we are inverting, if is in other words, is the inverse a function? When we invert a function, what we're basically doing is exchanging x and y. In other words, we're exchanging the domain and range. So rather than a vertical line test, we're going to use a horizontal line test. And on this graph here, if I draw a horizontal line, that's not what I drew. If I draw a horizontal line there, there are several spots where that horizontal line crosses the graph more than once. What that means is the inverse of that is not going to be a function. So what that means is in order to get a, a function that's an inverse, we would have to restrict the domain of the function. So if that is f of x, we'd have to restrict the domain of f of x so that f inverse of x is a function. So if I look at this one up here, if I restrict it so that f of x is only defined for x greater than or equal to zero, so the function only goes from here. Now when I do that horizontal line test, there's never more than one spot where it crosses that, that line, that graph. So now the inverse would be a function. So the inverse of a relation may exist. The inverse of a function may exist, but that function itself may not be a function. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some tools that are going to be handy for us as we go on and define some of the other common functions that are used in, in algebra and in calculus. Um, and the most common tool that is used to define functions, um, most specifically we're going to get into conic sections towards the end of the semester, we use something called the distance form. I'm not going to take a lot of time to develop this formula, but it comes off of your Pythagorean theorem. 
If you have two points on a graph, let's just make those the two points. The distance between them can be found by making a right triangle. And the dimensions of the right triangle, if I label my points here, x1, y1, and x2, y2, the legs of that right triangle are just the differences in the coordinates. This leg here is the difference of x2 minus x1 as that length. This leg here, that length is the difference of y2 minus y1. And we all remember in a right triangle, those two legs are sides A and B, and that hypotenuse, in this case, that would be the distance between the points is side C. We have that relationship, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. But we're going to rearrange that equation just a little bit. First, we're going to put C up front. And second, I'm going to remove the squared from C by putting a square root over the, the whole formula. So C is equal to the square root of A squared plus B squared. And from our drawing here, we know that A is the difference in the X coordinates. So that's X2 minus X1 squared. And that B is the difference in the Y coordinates. Y2 minus Y1, and that'll be squared. And that is our distance formula. Given any two points, X1, Y1, and X2, Y2, we can find the distance between them. If I ask you to find the distance between negative seven, three, and five, negative two. Just like with slope, it helps if I label them point one and point two. So the distance is gonna be the square root of x2 minus x1, what's x2 here? Point 0.2x coordinate is the 5, good. Minus x1, what's x1? Negative 7. Of course that's squared, plus what's y2? Negative two minus y1 is three, good. Of course, that's squared as well. So now it's just doing the order of operations. Five minus the negative seven, rather that's five plus seven, that's 12. That's gonna be squared. Plus negative three minus, or negative two minus three is negative five, and that'll be squared. Twelve squared is one forty-four. Negative five squared is positive twenty-five. One forty-four and twenty-five add up to one sixty-nine, and the square root of one sixty-nine is positive or negative thirteen. Since we're dealing with distance, we can assume we only want the negative one. Most of you have seen this formula before. It's an Algebra 1 formula. We want to look at it from a little bit different point of view. So we have, given the point 3, negative 7, Find the possible points of the form negative 
negative 5 comma y that are 17 units away. So this means we're looking at our distance formula again. But now we know the distance. We have 17 going in for D. If I label them point 0.1 and point 0.2, X2 is negative 5 minus X1 is 3. That's going to be squared. Plus Y2 is just Y minus Y1 of negative 7. And that'll be squared. Now, first thing I would do here if I'm trying to solve this is I'm going to combine what I can, just like any other equation, we combine what we can on either side. So negative 5 minus 3 is a negative 8. That's going to be squared. y minus a negative 7 is just y plus 7. And that's squared. I can still square the negative 8 here, which is going to be 64. y plus 7 squared, I just as well go, how, go and square this out. Oops, back here. Um, y plus 7 squared, I'm going to do the perfect square trinomial again. That's y squared plus 14y plus 49. You might be tempted not to square it at this point, but we're going to need to square it eventually anyway. And then I'm going to combine in there what I can again, the 64 and the 49. So I've got y squared plus 14 at 14y. 64 and 49 is 113. Now I can solve, I've combined everything I can, I'm gonna square both sides to get rid of that square root. 17 squared is 289 equals y squared plus 14y plus 113. Now this is a quadratic equation. It's y squared and y there, so I'm gonna have to get it equal to zero and factor, and solve each of those factors, or set each of those factors equal to zero. So I'm going to subtract the 289 from both sides. So I've got zero equals y squared plus 14y. 113 minus 289 is a negative 176. Now we could factor this, but let's go ahead and just do our uh, quadratic formula. We've got A here equals 1, B equals 14, and C equals negative 176. So opposite B, that'll be negative 14, plus or minus the square root of B squared will be 14 squared minus 4 times A times C, all over 2 times A. Let's do that first. I'm going to take a shortcut here, just to save some calculation. 14 squared minus 4 times 1 times negative 176. Gives us 900 inside there. This is negative 14 plus or minus the square root of 900. 2 times 1, of course, is just 2. The square root of 900 is 30. So what we have here is negative 14 plus or minus 30 over 2.
So if I do split this into two different possibilities, negative 14 plus 30 over 2, and negative 14 minus 30 over 2. Negative 14 plus 30 is 16, divided by 2 is 8. Negative 14 minus 30 is negative 44, divided by 2 is a negative 22. So to answer our question, those are the possible values for y. We wanted to find the points of the form negative 5 comma y. So those points are negative 5, 8, or negative 5 comma negative 22. Those are the points that will be 17 units away from that given point with the x-coordinate of negative 5. Any questions there? One of the applications of that is going to be circles. A circle is a set of points that are all the same distance from a center. Well, we like to use the origin as our center when we first define functions, just to make it simpler. So if the center of our circle is the origin, for some point out here, x and y, if I define the distance from that center to be r, well, the distance, the by drawing the right triangle here, this, this side is just x, and this side is just y, so x squared plus y squared has to equal r squared, the radius of that circle squared. And that actually is the general form of a circular equation. If I give you an equation, x squared plus y squared equals 16, That is a circle, and the radius is equal to 4. How did I get 4 for the radius? Well, because this number over here, the 16, is r squared equals 16. So the radius has to be the square root of 16. Now, again, we know that 16 has a positive and a negative root, but since we're dealing with distances, the positive is the only one that makes sense. Just like with our other functions, if I give you x squared plus y squared equals 4, that's a circle with the center at the origin. What's the radius going to be? Two, right? R squared is 4. So the square root of 4 is 2. So that is a circle with a radius of 2. Pretend that looks like a circle. What if I give you an equation? x minus 3 squared plus y plus 2 squared equals 4. This is just translating transforming our graph, moving it in direction. Remember, the number with the x moves it along the x-axis. It goes the opposite direction. This is x minus 3, so that means the center goes over positive 3. That's the x-coordinate of that center is now positive 3. The value with the y does the same thing, moves it in the y direction, but the opposite. That's y plus 2 we go down 2. So the coordinate of that center is now 3, negative 2. 
the radius is still 2. Still the same size. And it is really that simple to create a circle and graph a circle from its equation. What makes it a little bit more difficult is that not all of our equations for a circle start out in that form. Often they're given to us in a general form and we have to solve them to get them that way. We might have x squared plus 4x plus y squared plus, or minus, let's do, 6y equals, now let's make it minus 8y. I'll make it easy on myself. Make it 8y equals 5. Well, this is not in that form of, you know, x minus something squared and y minus something squared. What I can do is I can separate the x's and the y's and I can do that process that we learned a couple of weeks ago of completing the square. So I've got the x's here. x squared plus 4x. To complete the square, remember I take this value, I divide it by 2 and square it. So a half of 4 is 2, squared is 4. So I need to add a 4 here. That needs to be x squared plus 4x plus 4 in order for that to be a perfect square trinomial, x plus 2 squared. So if I have to add 4 here, I'm going to have to add 4 on the other side of the equation as well. If I look at my y's, y squared minus 8y. Again, to make that a perfect square trinomial, I look at the y term, that's negative 8y. Half of negative 8 is negative 4. I square that, I get 16. I have to add 16 there. That needs to be y squared minus 8y plus 16 for that to be a perfect square trinomial of y minus 4 squared. So I have to add 16 on the other side. So these two are still added together. What I get on the other side here is 5 plus 4 plus 16 is 25. This is a circle. Come on. The center of the circle is at negative 2, positive 4. Remember, it's the opposite of each of these. So negative 2, positive 4. I got to redraw my grid here so I got more room. So negative 2, positive 4, and my radius is 5. The square root of 25 is 5. It's a really ugly circle, but you guys get the point. Any questions? So just to kind of close the loop, we've done formulas here. We did the slope formula, the slope between two points, x1, y1, and x2, y2 is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. We've done distance now. The distance between two points is the square root of x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. And the third formula that falls into that group, not quite as useful, is the midpoint formula. The midpoint of those points is at the point, the average of the x coordinates, so x1 plus y, or x1 plus x2 divided by 2, and the average of the y coordinates y1 plus y2 divided by 2 gives you the y coordinate of the midpoint. Okay, we've covered a lot of material, so I think that's enough for today. Um, homework is sitting out there. This should be homework 3B now. 
covering this material. Of course, that'll be due for Thursday. Remember that homework 3A is due for tomorrow, Tuesday. That's from last week. And quiz 3, which is going to cover both of those materials, will be due this Friday. Okay, you guys have a great week. We'll see you all on Wednesday.